Hi everyone, this is Dr. Stefan. Welcome to Interstitial Lung Disease Info. In this episode, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about screening for pulmonary fibrosis or trying to find new cases of pulmonary fibrosis in healthy relatives of those who already have this type of conditions. And I received this comment that I'd like to read to, out to you first and then uh, provide you a couple of comments on how I understand the situation from my perspective. Uh, so I'm worried because uh, this is how the comment goes. I'm worried because even though I'm in, I, I'm only in my early 30s, my father, uncle, grandmother, all related, so on that side of the family, and now grandfather on my mother's side, so on the other side of the family, have all been diagnosed or died from this, so interstitial lung disease. I have a history of smoking and only recently gave up vaping. I have debated whether to get genetically tested or to have a scan. And I think it's a great comment that I received because it highlights, one, the uh, uncertainties that we have in this in managing these cases, which are to be honest, more frequent than we thought. And uh, I'm just saying that because I think a lot, well, there's lots of things here. So first of all, let's start with the idea that a lot of people don't even make the association that there is family history related to pulmonary fibrosis. And this can be both on the patient side and on the doctor's side. We don't have that awareness that there can be these situations. So I think the first step would be to first start to ask more. So if someone develops pulmonary fibrosis, I think it should be a default question to just ask whether there are other family members with similar conditions or other rare conditions. And the thing um, is that once we ask, we tend to find a lot of cases. And I can tell you from my normal practice, probably every week there's someone that has a suspicion, in my opinion, from my clinics. There's probably at least one person every week that I can identify in my clinics that has a suspicion that there's a familial case there. And then once we we know that it's potentially a familial case and we need to have some proof. So going and screening uh, random people for the presence of potentially some genes that have been linked with pulmonary fibrosis is probably not going to yield too much. And I'm just saying this because it is a bit complicated how we interpret the genetic uh, tests in the context of familial predisposition. It's not as straightforward as for other conditions. And the reason why I'm saying that is, is because in the case of a family, let's take, for example, this family that was uh, highlighted in this comment. So we've got a son who, or a daughter, sorry, uh, who is in their 30s, but then the father and the father's brother, so two people on that side of the family, and their mother, so the grandmother, they are they, uh, those people, they all had some form of pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease. The problem is, in most situations, in these families, so the younger person who raises this question probably doesn't have any respiratory symptoms, any chest problems. Now, the father and the uncle, they may have an interstitial lung disease, but it may not have the same diagnosis. So in the field of interstitial lung diseases, we have things like NSIP, so non-specific interstitial pneumonia, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and other things. So we may have different expressions of that familial disease in different family members because we are all the product of an interaction between our environment and our genetics. So every single one of us will get exposed to different things in life. That We will inhale different particles we will inhale different toxins and fumes. We will be exposed to different viruses, different bacteria, different infections. We will develop at different rates due to different kinds of things. So we may not get the same condition, the same expression that gets neatly put into a specific box at a certain point in time. So we might have different conditions, different phenotypes, we call that, of the same disease that may be linked to the same genetic predisposition. So that's why sometimes it can be difficult and tricky to identify that there is a familial case because all these other mem family members, they develop these lung conditions, but they may all be different. So it becomes really nuanced. The other thing is, um, when we do genetic tests, we currently, a genetic test is not a yes and no answer. So when we do a genetic test, generally we either do a panel of genes, we look at a panel of genes that have been linked with pulmonary fibrosis because the proteins that are produced by those genes, so that from the genetic code, the information in our genes, that can get translated into some proteins or building blocks of our body. Now, when those proteins do not function as expected, we may have different types of conditions in the body. And for example, we know that uh, there are some, some of these genes which have been linked with uh, a higher likelihood of getting pulmonary fibrosis. So when we look at those genes, we do generally what is called a panel of genes uh, testing. And that's the most common form of genetic testing. Now, obviously, when we test genes, 
people think that we find mutations. And I think this is something that we need to push back against. And this is what uh, the genetics community has been advocating for many years, to not call abnormalities in our genes mutations, because they should actually be called variants, because each and every one of us is actually very, very different. So what makes it interesting is that when we do a, a sequence of the, the genetic code in any person, we find maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of these variants because we are all different ethnically. We have, you know, different <laughs> um, places. We, we came from different places, different, uh, you know, gene pools. So we will have variants. And sometimes we cannot call these mutations. We, sometimes you can have very obvious changes in the genome, in the genetic code, but most often than not, we might have, more often than not, we might have just little changes between people. And some of these may be linked with a higher likelihood of getting pulmonary fibrosis. So this is where it becomes really, really tricky. So even if we test these genes, we may not always find a variant or a small change in the gene that is considered pathogenic. So that is linked to the development of that specific disease that we're testing for. So that was, this is the first step. Sometimes we may identify something that has been described in the literature, but as you can see, it's an emerging field. So not all the markers, all the genetic markers and all the genes have been identified, which have been linked to pulmonary fibrosis. So we are looking for a needle in a haystack and we're trying to pinpoint which is the, the exact genetic explanation for this familial predisposition. And it, I, I can tell you, it can be daunting. And we are just taking the first steps to identify which are these changes. So I hope you don't find this um, deflating in any way. It is actually a way forward because we are starting to discuss about this more and more and more and more people are getting tested. So getting all that genetic information together helps us paint a picture of what is actually going on and what is exactly causing the pulmonary fibrosis in these familial cases. Then there are some other tests that can be done. So for example, another test that can be done is to measure the telomere length. Now the telomere is basically the end uh, bit of the genetic code that is generally thought to protect the genomic code when the cells divide. So when a cell divides, the DNA within that cell needs to be copied into another copy that goes into the second cell. So then the cells separate. Now, when this process happens, this copying of the DNA happens, there is a risk for errors. But these telomeres seem to be there to protect the genetic code during cell division so that the telomere shortens, but the rest of the DNA is protected. And as we age, the telomeres shorten for each and every one of us. And there's very interesting research on what drives telomere shortening faster. <laughs> so this process can be accelerated in certain conditions. So for example, in extreme stress, in um, you, you know some predispositions in the genetic code, some toxins from the environment, there's lots of things that can potentially cause early telomere shortening. And when these telomeres become shortened progressively to the point where they are critically short, they cannot really protect the genome between uh, cell divisions, we might get to genetic instability and pre basically it would be a premature aging process. So we would get a lot of abnormalities once these telomeres get to the shortest possible length. So we can measure the telomere length. This is another genetic test that can be considered. But even with this, it becomes tricky because there are different techniques to do it. And some are better than others. Some require fresh blood to be taken and processed and analyzed within you know, the same day or so. Whereas others you can do from genetic uh, material that has been stored for longer. And these techniques may not always be interpretable from one to the other. You might not get the exact same result just because of the way the technique is done. So this is just to kind of outline a little bit how genetic testing is being conducted in cases of medial pulmonary fibrosis. Then on the second part of the question, it was mentioned about getting a CT scan of the chest. This is again, some a niche, an area where we don't have very clear guidelines. We are starting to think about this a little bit more, but there are a few things that are not known. So the, the chest CT scan is very sensitive at picking up little changes, very early changes of pulmonary fibrosis. We know that. So it can be a very useful test. And potentially in someone who has a familial predisposition, getting a chest CT scan at some point may be a good idea. The problem is we don't know what the optimum age is to start screening. Sometimes we may have situations in which we get genetic anticipation. And I'll explain this a little bit because it's an important concept. So for example, 
if we notice that within a family, and this is where a very careful family history is very, very important. If, for example, in this case, the grandmother who was the, the person furthest back in the generations who was identified of, uh, as having interstitial lung disease. If, for example, she developed her lung condition in her late 70s, but then her sons, so the father and the uncle mentioned in the comment, if they developed their condition in their mid-60s, we call that a process of genetic anticipation, and it can be linked to the way the genetic information is passed on with some abnormalities already that accelerate the process. So we have a shorter timeline until we develop these conditions. And then the next generation over can potentially get condi this condition, this interstitial lung disease, maybe in their 50s. So this is what it means, that as we go through the generations, some of these predispositions manifest themselves earlier in life. And this is an interesting thing, because then we may consider scanning younger relatives uh, quicker, rather than waiting for the normal age of onset of conditions such as pulmonary fibrosis, which is usually after the age of 50. So if we're talking about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis for specifically, that is a condition that is most commonly seen after the age of 70. So if we have, however, family predisposition, strong family predisposition of pulmonary fibrosis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, for, for instance, we may want to consider doing the, the CT scan a little bit earlier, maybe in the 60s. So it becomes a little bit tricky. So this is the first part. The, the other part is how quickly will these changes progress? And what do we find on the scan? And what do we do with the result? Because, for example, if we're scanning someone who doesn't have any chest conditions, but we find some very minor abnormalities. We have no way of knowing how quickly those will progress or whether they will stay the same. So this is where it becomes really, really tricky. How do, how do we interpret and what do we do with the result of the scan? Because it may lead to undue stress and panic and people might end up having chest scans every year, which they do not need and which they carry, which can also carry you know, a risk of getting too much radiation from all these scans. And especially uh, if we do, in, for example, in, in women who are of a younger age and we do too many of these scans, it can increase the risk of you know, things like breast cancer and all these other things. So we need to balance the risks of uh, what we find with the risks of doing too much testing and how that affects the person's life. This is where it becomes really, really complicated. So that's why we don't have guidelines. But what we would do normally in these situations is we might do a one-off scan at some point, especially if the person is worried. However, depending on where you are in the world and the health system that you are operating in, this scan for a healthy individual may or may not be reimbursed. So the person may end up having to do that scan out of pocket in some instances, which is a bit of a shame, but it's just how the system works at the moment because we are only allowed to, for example, treat the uh, scan people who have a suspicion of an illness or, for example, who, <coughs> apologies, we would only do genetic testing in certain individuals who already have a condition, not necessarily in healthy relatives. So some of these things have not been worked out. Then let's say we do a scan of the chest in a person in their 40s and we pick up some small little changes. But there are no um, significant changes on the lungs. There is something there, but we can't really classify it. It's very early change. And that person has no respiratory symptoms. It's an incidental finding. In that situation, we call that interstitial lung abnormalities or ILAs. And this is a very, very huge topic because we tend to find more and more of these cases of people who have these little interstitial lung abnormalities who are absolutely fine otherwise. And we don't know whether these will actually turn into fibrosis or not. We don't know what the pre prevalence of that change is. So I can give you the other example. Uh, there is lung cancer screening. So people who are heavy smokers in their 50s, for example, may sometimes undergo lung cancer screening. And they will have a chest CT scan of their chest, a uh, chest CT scan, looking for evidence of cancer in heavy smokers, a high risk population. We may not find an evidence of cancer, but up to 7% of these scans may actually show abnormalities, which can be linked to these interstitial lung abnormalities that I was describing. So that's a huge number, if you think about it. And 
obviously we are not getting that much interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis. So there is a disconnect. So we don't know how, ma how many of these people actually end up going to, uh, ahead, developing progressive pulmonary fibrosis that is clinically relevant. So as, I, as I'm trying to, you know, present things here in a very nuanced way, I'm just trying to, to tell you that it is a debate and the person who has put this comment forward really has, it makes a lot of sense. It's a big debate whether to get a genetic test and whether to get a scan. Because currently we may just do these tests, but that will mean that we sign up to doing even more tests in the future because we need to assess the behavior of the condition. Now, what we would normally do, just on a pragmatic note, we would probably do the scan. We may or may not find something. If we don't find anything, we would then maybe see that person every now and then, maybe one year, every two years, every three years, or maybe uh, if there are any respiratory symptoms that pop up, breathlessness, cough, things like that, maybe we would do another check, maybe do a breathing test, see if that changes, a lung function test. So there are different algorithms for monitoring people who have these familial predispositions, but there's no one rule. But there are research projects in the making now, which will hopefully answer these questions. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll have better answers for our patients who come up with these amazing questions that I receive on the channel. Thank you very much for watching and listening uh, if you're on the podcast for this one. And if you have further questions, do leave them in the comment section below. I'm really looking forward to growing the uh, information based on this channel because I think it's really necessary just to present these points in a more nuanced way. I'm sorry these videos do tend to get a little bit long sometimes, but it's hard to, to put these explanations in a shorter format sometimes because they don't tend to apply uh, perfectly to each situation. Thank you very much for watching. All the best. Good health.